With more screen usage and indoor time, myopia, also known as nearsightedness, is increasing and getting worse in children. Now, certified eye doctors can prescribe my sight one day, the first and only FDA-approved soft contact lens to slow myopia progression in age-appropriate children. Visit coopervision.com to find a Brilliant Futures certified eye doctor near you. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromicel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and Micromicel technology. Do your patients know what presbyopia is? There are people who are afraid of the press. Have you talked to your patients about multifocal contact lenses? I've heard the bifocal, but not right, multifocal. Exactly. Not multifocal. Do you need help with your multifocal strategy? Learn more at the conclusion of this episode. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Good morning, I'm Dr. Kerry Gelb, and welcome to Open Your Eyes Radio. Please listen as I discuss the newest information in the world of health, nutrition, and sports every Saturday morning, 9 a.m. Central Time on AM 1280, The Patriot. Also, please share your thoughts by emailing me at drkerrygelb at gmail.com. That's D-R-K-E-R-R-Y-G-E-L-B at gmail.com. Americans have been told by so-called health experts to eat a low-fat diet, consume vegetable oils because they lower cholesterol. American health agencies also recommend their citizens avoid saturated fat, butter, and salt. Today's guest is Sally Fallon Morrell. Sally's extensive research proves nourishing fat is helpful and not our enemy. Sally is a student of the great Dr. Weston A. Price. Sally is the founder and current president of the Weston A. F Price Foundation and best-selling author. Sally's many books can be found under the Nourishing Tra Traditions label and look for her latest book, The Contagion Myth, co-authored with Dr. Thomas Cowan, MD. Sally, welcome to the show. Thanks. Thanks for having me. You know, Sally, I've been a fan of yours for a long time, and I've studied uh, Dr. Weston Price, and uh, I'm friends with Dr. Kenobi, who's been on this show. Uh, tell me how you got interested in the work of Dr. Price. Well, I read his book in the 1970s, I think it was 1974, and it resonated with me because I grew up in a family of, uh, shall we say, Francophiles and gourmets, and we had always eaten a very rich diet. We were all healthy and loved to cook, and around the 1970s or 1960s, I would say, this low-fat thing started to come out. And I thought, oh, this is just disgusting. Who wants to eat this way? And I just knew from the beginning that this was uh, certainly not a fun way to eat uh, and probably not healthy. And then I read Dr. Price's book and how the emphasis on the rich organ meats and fats of the animals uh, uh, was so important in these healthy people. So I just continued my merry way, uh, cooking with butter and eating lots of eggs and cheese and I like to liver, and so I just continued uh, eating that way. The um, message got more strident as the years went on, and in 1991, the National Cholesterol Education Campaign um, decided that all children from the age of two were going to be on this low-fat diet. And by that time, I was really getting into this, a few years later, I met Mary Ennig, who is my co-author of Nourishing Traditions, and we started writing about this because children absolutely need animal fats to grow uh, normally, 
And I'll give you an example. If you buy um, what they call milk replacer for calves, the third ingredient is animal fats. It just says it right on the label, animal fat. Because they know that mammals need animal fats to grow normally, okay? But there is no animal fat at all. There's no cholesterol at all in baby formula. It's just vegetable oils and skim milk. So it's designed to make these children sick and prevent them from having normal development. I have a question about about the milk because in schools they they give kids low fat milk, not whole milk. Can right. So that? this is part of the decree that children are only supposed to have uh, low fat milk uh, because the fats will make them fat. And this is totally against the science. There have been studies showing that children who've been deprived of animal fats, children on low fat milk, uh, end up fatter, and they end up eating more sugar and with having more insulin resistance. So it's against the science. So you might ask yourself, why are they doing this? And why doesn't the dairy industry object to this? Well, the dairy industry has figured out, the accountants have figured out that if you eat butter, they only get $5, you only pay $5 a pound for the butter fat in the butter. But if you eat ice cream, you pay $25 a pound for the butter fat in the ice cream. So what they want you to do is starve yourself all day long of the fats you need. And by time evening comes, you're absolutely famished for fats. Your body is crying out for fats. And because they tell you butter is bad, you go to the freezer and pull out a quart of ice cream and eat the whole thing. And standing up in front of the freezer, you know? Uh, this is what happens and this is what they want to have happen. So basically, our food policy is being dictated by the accountants. I think there's something wrong with that. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, and how could people at night, you know, people go, go all day long and not be hungry and at night, like you said, they're famished. How could we prevent that from happening where people aren't starving at night and overeating at night and being on the sumo wrestler diet uh, so where they eat and then they go to sleep? How can we be satisfied? What would be the best way to eat? Well, well, first, you eat a good breakfast. And by a good breakfast, I don't mean the breakfast they're giving these kids in schools, which is low-fat milk. And by the way, they hate the low-fat milk. So they drink chocolate milk, which is low-fat, but it's full of sugar, right? And cereal. Uh, and they give them Pop-Tarts. And you know, it's just high-carb, high-sugar. So you give your kids a really good breakfast. That means eggs, bacon, uh, sourdough bread with lots of butter on it, maybe cheese, uh, maybe leftover meat. Could be salami if you want, you know, if you were in a hurry. But, um, you know, the traditional American breakfast is actually uh, a wonderful breakfast. And I have a lot of friends have said to me, oh, you know what? I am going to dedicate myself to changing the school lunches. And I say, don't bother, don't waste your time. It's not going to happen. It's cast in concrete by forces a lot greater than yourself. What you can do is dedicate yourself to giving your kids a good breakfast and making their lunch. You know, so we take these children one family at a time. There's this whole thing with fasting, you know, where they're telling people they could skip breakfast, skip lunch, and only eat at night. Well, what's your opinion on that? Well, I actually, I've, I've never heard that. I'm, uh, I've heard about fasting for detox, but um, I just think it's a terrible plan. You, you need to be sustained all day long with uh, good food. And do you have some health secrets that you talk about, three regular meals a day? If you could go into that a little bit for us. Well, I do think the, I, personally, it's it's two or three. Now, I think as you get older, and I put myself in that category, um, and you're watching your weight, I, I, I eat two meals a day. Uh, big breakfast, a really big breakfast and a big lunch around one o'clock, and then I don't eat dinner. But my husband, who... I despair of keeping the weight on him, you know, he gets three meals a day. So that depends. But children definitely need uh, three meals a day and meals that contain good fats, good protein, whole foods, 
uh, really satisfying, delicious meals. So they don't want a snack in between meals. And, and the snacks are, you know, the killers, really the potato chips and the cookies. And there's just nothing good about these foods. And if they are going to snack, what would you recommend they kids would snack on? A cheese. <laughs> give them a piece of cheese. Give them a piece of salami. Something, you know, substantial. Uh, that has got a lot of fat in it. And I want to talk about raw milk a little bit, a, a little bit later on, but a lot of states, even where they don't allow raw milk, they do allow raw milk cheese. So you'll yeah. go into the supermarket, uh, Whole Foods or Fresh Market, and they, they might not have raw milk, but they have raw milk cheese. Well, you, you have to be careful. Because a lot of cheese says it's unpasteurized or raw, and it's not. It's heated to 150 degrees. So use our shopping guide from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We update this every year and it will give you, we check anyone who's calling their cheese raw, we call them and ask, well, how, how high do you heat the, cheese, the milk? So um, you have to be careful. Um, but just going back to raw milk, which we highly recommend, it's a wonderful food for growing children. Um, we have made so much progress in the last 20 years. When we started this campaign, there were maybe 20 sources of raw milk in the whole country. And now there's an excess of 2,000. Many are not listed, but go to our website, realmilk.com, and you can, you can find raw milk. My grandsons in California, uh, they can buy it at, at stores. Uh, my grandsons in Austin, Texas, they go to the farmer's market and get raw milk. But it, it's out there uh, pretty much everywhere. So at rawmilk.com, you could find real, out, real milk. Real milk com. You could find we here at raw milk and other websites is the Weston Price uh, dot org. And then you have Weston your, A Price dot org. Mm -hmm. Weston A and Nourishing Traditions is your website, right? Yes. Yes. And this I just want to tell people because I've gone to all these websites and there's tons of great information. Uh, and on the westernaprice.org, you could take a tour. It's so complex that you take a tour and you can <laughs> find out uh, all different types of information that could be helpful. So how about colostrum with raw milk? How, how, how do we get colostrum? How could people get that? Because that could be very helpful and helpful and beneficial to, to people. Well, I, I once had a friend from Turkey who said when she was a little girl, in the spring, her mother went out to the countryside, scoured the countryside to find a farmer who would sell her colost fresh colostrum. And she brought, brought it home and lined all the children up and everybody had to have a glass of colostrum. Uh, so the cow only makes colostrum for about three or four days. And you sort of have to know a farmer and get your colostrum fresh. I am, I am concerned about powdered colostrum because um, a recent study showed that even if you freeze dry milk, it still disrupts the proteins and um, makes them very hard to digest. So if you eat yeah. colostrum in a, in a, in a supplement, uh, it may yeah, not be as good. It may not be helpful, no. So let's go back to Weston A. Price, the de he's a, who was a dentist. Uh, talk about some of the things that he discovered as he traveled around the world to look at different cultures, which were healthy versus unhealthy. Right. Well, he found 14 groups that were very healthy based on their teeth. He first looked at their teeth. So they had no cavities and very naturally straight teeth. Nobody needed braces. They had broad faces. So basically the diet was bringing out the optimal expression of the genetic potential, because that's what we're all programmed to do is have a broad face with straight teeth, but it doesn't always happen because of the diet and the building materials are not adequate to uh, have strong bones in the face and have a broad face. So he found 14 groups and their diets were all different. Uh, you had uh, in Switzerland, in the remote valleys, they were eating dairy foods, raw dairy foods, uh, some meat and uh, sourdough rye bread. In the South Seas, they had fish and pork and um, tubers like sweet potatoes and taro. Uh, in Alaska, they had very few plant foods, but lots of fish, lots of fermented 
meat and fish and, and meat um, with big emphasis on the fat. Uh, in Africa, he found uh, various diets. So the particulars of the diet were all different, but there were some underlying commonalities. And, and the main one was these diets were nutrient dense. They were um, four times higher in minerals than the American diet of his day, and 10 times higher in what he called the fat soluble vitamins, vitamins A, D, and K. So our big emphasis is helping people have a diet that's nutrient dense and particularly high in A, D, and K. And where do we get A, D, and K? We get them from animal fats, organ meats, uh, fish eggs, uh, certain types of fish, shellfish, um, uh, butterfat, of course, eggs from pastured chickens. So that's our big emphasis is helping people get, uh, helping people maximize the fat soluble vitamins in their diet. And this means you need, you have to completely ignore the dietary guidelines. And cooking, what should we cook in? What would, what's the best should it be? Coconut oil, butter, and what's the difference between beef tallow and lard? Okay, so we cook in lard. Lard is a wonderful fat for cooking and it's a great source of vitamin D. Natural vitamin D complex is in lard. Uh, we use butter for our vegetables and our bread, and um, I, 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 you can cook in butter, but um, we use butter for the vitamin A and lard for the vitamin D. Um, an, another great uh, source of fat-soluble vitamins is poultry fat, so duck fat and goose fat, and I do cook in those as well. Uh, tallow is not so rich in the fat soluble vitamins, but it's very, very stable. So if I want to actually fry something nice and crisp, I use tallow. And tallow is more from a cow and lard is from a pig. Is that correct? Right. So tallow is from a ruminant, like a sheep or cow, and it's very hard fat. That doesn't mean it's bad for you. It means it's actually safe to cook in. And then uh, lard is a little small, uh, softer, and that comes from pigs. Macu Health, your science born and tested solutions for visual performance, macular degeneration, and dry eye syndrome. New products coming soon. Embrace the science. The All Eyes Visual All VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. And when people eat meat, they tell them a lot of times, cut away the fat yeah, and don't eat the fat. That's the worst the advice. So this is a universal rule all over the world among healthy traditional people. They never ate lean meat. There was a recent study in Australia where um, they interviewed these guys, you know, aboriginals living out in the bush. And they asked them what they ate and they ate all kinds of things, but only at certain times of the year. For example, there was a certain time of the year when the kangaroo was fat and that's when they hunted kangaroo. If, if they killed a kangaroo that was lean, it was called rubbish and they just threw it away. They never wanted lean meat. Same with the American Indians. They always wanted the fat, the buffalo hump fat, or the fat from the beaver, beaver tail. Um, if, if they couldn't get enough fat, they, um, they knew they'd get very sick, and they called that rabbit hunger. It was like eating rabbits, because rabbits are so lean. Um, ever, um, South Seas, when they cooked the pig underground, they saved all the fat. They put it in a, um, a vessel made of banana leaves to, to save all that fat. So uh, same with the Eskimos. Um, traditional cultures never ate skim milk. They always drank the milk with fat. So this is kind of a universal rule that you never eat lean meat or skim milk or any, any kind of protein without the fat. And, and that's why I'm so concerned about protein powders, because they're just lean protein, and they're very hard on the kidneys. And if you could mention a little bit about protein powders, also, they have found heavy metals in some of the protein powders. I'm not surprised. And they're very hard to digest. They're made with different kinds of legumes 
or they're made with uh, powdered whey. And these are going to be very difficult to digest. Um, see, legumes need a long, slow, careful preparation. I'm not saying you can't eat them, but they, uh, they require a very careful type of cooking. And the whey proteins are extremely fragile, and they are totally warped and distorted by the powdering process. So, the, you know, and the thing is, the one thing we don't need in the uh, Western diet is protein. <laughs> we get plenty of protein. Uh, so I think we get too much protein, maybe. But um, we don't need extra protein that you get in these protein powders. And how about for the, the kids that go to the gym, they work out, and then they want, what should they eat after coming back from the gym? And should they eat anything before going to the gym? Well, I'm, I'm not an expert on this, but we actually did an article on the history of uh, bodybuilding, a history of diets for bodybuilders. We did this article a long time ago. And of course, we didn't used to have all these pills and, and potions and protein powders. Uh, raw milk was a big favorite among bodybuilders. Liver, uh, oysters. Uh, so, you know, real man foods, that's what they ate. And you have a book from your nourishing traditions uh, on, you have a cookbook. Um, yeah. When you wrote the cookbook, tell us a little bit uh, the backstory on the, the cookbook. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got the idea to write this book in 1990. Um, my fourth and last child was in school full time. I had more time on my hands. And so I, I thought, you know, if I write a cookbook, uh, what kind of book would it be? And I wanted to write a book that put Dr. Price's findings in a uh, form that uh, was accessible to the population. So that was my goal. And I had a lot of help from Dr. Mary Ennig, who really supplied me with the science of what I was saying. Uh, yeah, so it came out in 96. And I kind of got a slow start, but it was word of mouth. <laughs> and suddenly I had a book that was really selling. Uh, and there are a lot of unique things in the book, not just the emphasis on the animal fats, but I talk about the benefits of bone broth, proper preparation of grains. Um, I basically introduced lacto-fermented foods uh, to the public, talked about the importance of salt in the diet. So all of the themes were there. Let's talk about salt a little bit. You know, we're told to stay away from salt. And when they do process salt, there's aluminum in it. They, they process it with aluminum and, you know, and then, you know, then you have people like uh, Dr. Nicola Antonio, if I'm pronouncing his, who, who recommends salt and maybe uh, different types of salt, colored salt, such as Himalayan salt, because when it's colored, it has minerals in it. So tell us, yeah. give us the skinny on the salt. Is it good, bad, or... Should we, are we well, you, abs to you absolutely need salt. Um, our requirement for salt is at least a teaspoon and a half per day. Some people need more. Around the turn of the century, we were eating about three teaspoons of salt a day because all our meat was salted, meat and fish was salted. And that's how it was preserved. So when refrigeration came along, our salt consumption went down but we still need at least a teaspoon and a half a day. And uh, a really definitive study uh, showed that the best outcomes were uh, in people who ate between one and a half and three teaspoons a day. And as I said, some people need more. Now, we, like you, we recommend unrefined salt that's beige, gray, or pink, not white, because the white salt is refined. All the trace minerals have been taken out and they use aluminum so that it doesn't stick together. And so it pours when it rains. Uh, and so why do we need salt? Well, we need sodium for all kinds of enzymes. Uh, we need sodium for um, the enzymes that repair our glial cells in the brain. Uh, salt is involved in hormone production, so sodium is. But we also need the chloride portion of salt because uh, salt is our only source of chloride in the diet. And uh, with the very few exceptions. And what, why do we need chloride? We need chloride to make hydrochloric acid so we can digest meat. And if you're not eating enough salt, you're going to have a hard time with uh, digestion, 
meat and, and any protein, really. And it, is, do you prefer Himalayan or is there any type that you prefer? Well, I use the Celtic sea salts, but they're all fine. Um, the pink salts, like the Hawaiian and the Himalayan salt, are high in iron, which is fine. Um, but the, they have different mineral profiles, but they're all good. Now, now I'm going to ask you, a, uh, I'm sure everybody asks you about this. You, you've had some recipes on sweets. You know, everybody wants sweets at the end of the meal. Can we have sweets? Should we stay away from sweets? And if we can, we should make it ourselves. What kind of sweets should we have? And maybe give us a recipe for something with traditional cookies based with crispy nuts or something. Okay. So I think we do have a sweet taste bud in our mouth. And I think this needs to be satisfied in an appropriate way. And I think if you raise your children so that they don't never get any sweets, they're gonna rebel because they, they're missing something, you see. I think the sweets should come from the parents. They should be homemade desserts uh, that they get at the end of their meal that they deserve, you know, uh, in moderate amounts. Well, I think one of the best uh, sweet desserts is homemade ice cream which you make with uh, preferably raw cream, egg yolks, uh, natural sweetener, and a little pinch of salt. And it's just delicious. There's nothing on earth quite like homemade ice cream if it's made with the right ingredients. You definitely don't want commercial ice cream, which has got all sorts of junk in it. And it's way, way too sweet. <clears throat> and with the type of uh, ice cream makers that you can get today, it's just so easy. You just Pour it in, plug it in, turn it on, and in half an hour, you've got ice cream. So very, very easy to make ice cream. Uh, the cookie recipes in Nourishing Tradition are based on what we call crispy nuts. And these are nuts that have been soaked in salt water and then drained and dehydrated, and they're much more digestible than raw nuts. And we make the cookies with arrowroot powder and a natural sweetener like maple sugar and seasonings and butter and some salt. And they really are delicious. They are a great hit from the book and they're gluten-free if that's important to you. You know, you talk a lot about digestion and it's, it's almost not exactly what we eat, but what we absorb. How can we absorb our food, our vitamins from our food better? Well, this is a great question. And I think Nourishing Traditions was really the first book that looked at digestion because in the traditional cultures, they spend a lot of time preparing their food in a way that pre-digests it because the human beings have a very simple digestive tract. Uh, you know, the cow has four stomachs. So she can eat grass and she can digest cellulose. We can't digest cellulose. <laughs> it's indigestible to us. We So, you know, real uh, tough vegetables and things we have to cook cook it first to break down that cellulose. So uh, the proper preparation, depending on what the food is, it could be uh, cook cooking, fermentation, soaking, um, soaking with salt, soaking with an acidic medium. It, it just depends on the food. But all these preparation techniques um, break down the anti-nutrients and the indigestible components and make these foods easier, easier to digest. And, you know, children, uh, well, I would say in the past had robust digestive systems are young and full of energy. But as you get older, it's really important to pay attention to how you prepare your food. And today we're getting children who can't digest anything. It's just tragic. And this is because the people are getting weaker with each generation. And I guess you know, we're, the foods that we're eating is all processed and, you know, Very hard to digest, yeah. not made to digest. And I, I've heard you talk about ox, ox bile tablets. Uh, can you mention that and the benefits yeah. and what exactly that is? Is that so? So um, <clears throat> people who are having trouble digesting fats or people who've had their gallbladders removed. Um, the gallbladder stores bile. <clears throat> But a lot of people have trouble making bile. It's made out of cholesterol, so it involves a lot of enzymes. So if you're if eating a rich diet makes you nauseous, this means that you need 
uh, vial, and that's what the ox bile tablets give you. And it's really helpful uh, to a lot of people to take an ox bile tablet with your meal. And how about Swedish bitters? Yeah, the Swedish bitters is also great for stimulating the production of bile. I personally take Swedish bitters every day. So there's lots of things you can do to assist your digestion. And where can you find Swedish bitters? Uh, well, that, that little store on the internet starts with an A. <laughs> yeah, you can get them in lots of places. You can order them online. A lot of health food stores will carry them. And how about fermented foods? How does that help us with digestion? Right. So, you know, this is really interesting. And this isn't something that Dr. Price talked about because he didn't even know about this. But every single traditional culture in the world has fermented foods. There's no exceptions to this. The Eskimos fermented meat and fish. The Africans fermented their grains. They made uh, sour fermented beverages. The Europeans fermented cabbage and vegetables. Uh, they Their beers were low alcohol, lacto-fermented beers. So this is found in every culture. And we definitely need these types of foods in our diet. Uh, one very popular food today is kombucha, which is available in many stores. I, I make my own kombucha, but it's a lacto-fermented food, and it's very helpful for digestion. I want to ask you about kombucha because they sell it in Whole Foods and a lot of the supermarkets now mm -hmm. everywhere. And I guess, you know, I look and uh, my memory serves me correct correctly. Maybe it has eight to 10 grams of sugar in it. Is that okay? Is, are we okay with that? Yeah, I think so. Some brands are a lot sweeter than others. I think you want to limit yourself to five grams of sugar per serving. No more. Uh, otherwise, you're going get, to be getting a lot of sugar. A little bit's fine. And the, the beverage should taste sour. It's supposed to be sour. So you're, you're definitely okay with kombucha. No problem with that. I, yeah. I mean, I drink it every day. Yeah. Now, I make my own though, and it's very sour. And my wife makes hers too, so uh, it's it's you know it's really terrific. But uh, what I like about kombucha, it is such a wonderful replacement to soft drinks. And soft drinks are about the most unhealthy thing you could put into your body. And kombucha tastes a lot better. It's more refreshing, and it's good for your body. And it really is so refreshing. Yeah. Uh, you know, and by the way, it's great for alcoholics. You know, the alcoholic is still looking for some kind of beverage that gives him a lift, so to speak, and kombucha does that. You know, you said before you're not that big with sports, but I'm gonna maybe you know the answer to this question. I have a 13 year old who plays baseball, and it gets very, very hot. What yeah. kind of drink would you recommend he takes, or the kids that are playing sports take with it? Would it be coconut water? Would it be kombucha? Would it be water with lemons and fruits in it? What would you recommend? Well, it would be, yeah, coconut water is good. Kombucha is good. And then um, there's something in the my book called Haymakers Oat Water, where you soak oats in water. And this is what they ate uh, or drank when they were bringing in the hay in the hot sun. And they had to work all day in the hot sun. So that's in the book. And something like that would be really good. Which book is that in? Did you have a lot oh, of Oh, Nourishing Traditions. It's in Nourishing Traditions. You know, you do have a, you have a lot of books and I can't wait to talk about, because you wrote about babies, you have great books on babies. We're going to talk about that in a minute, but I want to ask you, with, with, uh, carbohydrates, uh, you know, uh, grains, you talk about that grains can be okay, but they have to be soaked for quite a while. Well, okay, so... Uh... <laughs> You know, back in the 70s, we got on the whole grain bandwagon and people were eating oat bran. Remember the oat bran fad? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and very soon after that, we started to get people with gluten intolerance and who couldn't manage the, any grains. And that's because whole grains are very difficult to digest. And I think we should eat whole grains, but only after careful preparation. So what is the right preparation? Well, for our bread, it's the genuine sourdough. This is basically a long, slow fermentation. 
And before the invention of um, brewer's yeast, we had sourdough. That's the only way you could make bread rise. And you had, it was a very slow process. So a sa genuine sourdough bread with organic grains because the wheat is just loaded with Roundup. They're allowed to spray Roundup on the wheat just before harvest to desiccate it, which is just a terrible idea. So in the last 20 years, we've been, our poor growing children just overloaded with uh, glyphosate, which very much affects the connective tissue, by the way, very bad for athletes and growing children. So um, uh, oatmeal, uh, we soak our oatmeal overnight in uh, warm, slightly acid water. You can add some yogurt or vinegar or something to the water. And then the next day you cook your oatmeal with a little salt. And I always tell this story. I thought I was allergic to oats when my mother made oatmeal and I went to school eating an oatmeal breakfast. I would be on the floor by 10 o'clock in the morning. I just hardly function. I would break out in a sweat. It was like a toxic shock and I had to run to the bathroom. And so I stopped eating oatmeal. I thought I must be allergic to oatmeal. But when I figured out about soaking my oats and I ate the oatmeal that way, no problem. No toxic shock, no, no reaction. So this, the soaking, uh, the, it's basically a type of fermentation uh, neutralizes the, there's toxins in grains and these are neutralized by the proper preparation. The All Eyes Visual VRP is a portable vision testing platform that includes visual fields, acuity, color vision testing, pupillometry, and extraocular motility. The visual leverages virtual reality, artificial intelligence, and augmented technologies to enable eye care providers to test for and monitor common eye diseases. Visit alleyes.com for more information. Your eyes and your vision are under attack, damaging blue light from the sun. Your phone, your computer, your tablet, even light bulbs and car headlights is constantly bombarding you. The good news is our eyes actually already have a line of defense to counter the effects of blue light. This defense is made up of three pigments called carotenoids. MacU Health with Micromycel, the only supplement with the exclusive patent on all three macular carotenoids and micromycel technology. Fitting multifocal contact lenses presents a big opportunity to meet patient needs while growing your practice. Alcon is your partner not only with our innovative portfolio, but through e-learning. Learn to enhance your multifocal strategy today with the Alcon Experience Academy. OIE Broadcasting is the emerging leader in social media. We use scientific entertainment to drive more patients into your office. Visit OIEBroadcasting.com and sign up today.